I'm, I'm going to read Edwin Rolfe's Season of Death, and I'll turn to um, several of you, um, Amaris, Gabe, and Amber Rose, for initial responses to the poem, and also to Chris, who's on the line. It's the sixth winter of the Great Depression, the, uh, the um, unemployment rate where Rolfe was when he wrote this poem was about 35%. Uh, people were really starving. They were really destitute. One of the things that the Communist Party of the United States of America, CPUSA, was working on was to prevent evictions. And so one of the things they did is when they heard about an eviction, they would go to the site of eviction. They'd physically prevent it from happening. Uh, so Roth was very much part of that political action. He wanted to tell a story of what it's like to live on the street at that time. So season of death. So the sixth winter would be 1935. You just have to count the, count the years of the depression. This is the sixth winter. This is the season of death when lungs contract and the breath of homeless men freezes on restaurant window panes. Men seeking the sight of rare food before the head is lowered into the upturned collar and the shoulders haunched and the shuffling feet move away slowly slowly disappear into a darkened street. This is the season when rents go up. Men die and their dying is casual. I walk along the street returning at midnight from my unit. Unit is a reference to his communist cell. It's a, it's a political reference. He's had a meeting. I walk along the street returning at midnight from my unit. Meet a man leaning against an illumined, illumined wall and ask him for a light. His open eyes stay fixed on mine, and cold rain falling trickles down his nose, his chin. Buddy, I begin, and look more closely and flee in horror from the corpse's grin. The eyes pursue you even in sleep, and when you awake, they stare at you from the ceiling. You see the dead face peering from your shoes. The eggs at Thompson's are the dead man's eyes. Work dims them for eight hours, but then the machines silent, they appear again. Along the docks, in the terminals, in the subway, on the street, in restaurants. The eyes are focused from the river among the floating garbage that other men fish for, their hands around poles, almost in prayer, wanting to live, wanting to live, who also soon will stand propped by death against a stone cold wall. Um, we're gonna turn Amaris, Gabe, Amber Rose, and Chris on the phone for just quick first reactions, first responses to that poem. Anything you like, Gabe, you wanna start? Sure, I'll start. Um, for me, something that's like uh, one of the interesting moments in it is the kind of the, the issue of labor returns sort of post this uh, traumatic event, right? So that like you have this moment where um, Rolf Speaker says that the eyes, the like memory of this traumatic corpse um, go away during a work day. Um, and once the machines of work go silent, they come back. But at the same time, you have this other moment where the eggs, which is a product of somebody's labor, are also the eyes. So it, it's got this really unsteady relationship to the work, um, to, to income, and to, and to sort of what we might call making ends meet. Gabe, thank you so much. Um, Amber Rose, can we turn to you for a quick response to this? Yeah, I have um, two thoughts. Uh, the first thing that I want to say actually is, again, about the weather, um, because I think this poem also sort of has a has an environment. Um, and I just want to recognize that that metaphor, that theoretical gift um, is from Christina Sharp's work, um, her work in the wake. I see a lot of people talking about it on Twitter and YouTube. So I just want to point you to her work. Um, and to say that she uses the weather to talk about the climate of anti-blackness 
um, under which everything else is happening. Um, and so that is present too in this poem. And thinking about that, the two lines that stick out for me um, are, this is the season when rents go up, men die and their dying is casual. And then at the end, the repetition of wanting to live. Yeah. And I'm thinking about all of those things kind of compressed together. Um, uh, thinking today about landlord strikes and not having money and rent still going up and the compression of that with, with a deathliness that becomes casual um, and, and what it means for those that are dying, for those that are mourning and for those that are able to live next to that deathliness. Um, and then I think that repetition wanting to live and then in italics wanting to live, um, I'm, I'm hearing so many voices uh, that are saying that alongside um and that echo is just sort of um yeah moving in me right now thank you amber rose amaris your thought on this poem yeah um i was also struck by the image of the dead eyes particularly to put that in conversation with the dorothea lang photograph where we see that there are no eyes in those photos um, the eyes are downcast if we see a face at all and I see that as dead in the sense of, you know, unseeing and unseen because these men don't see a way forward. There's a loss of agency. Of course, there's the literal death, the dying is casual because statistically men were um, dying from hunger across the nation. But there's also perhaps um, significantly also a death of dignity, a death of self-worth um, that like we were saying before, is so key to the American ethos of individuality and you know, you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, but what if the situation leaves you completely helpless and unable to do that? And I think it's interesting that in the first photograph we're talking about, in the breadline photograph that's before um, the New Deal kicked in and government aid was available to these men, um, but they're still left just waiting in this very static image, um, begging for help. Um, um, so the action that's available to them, to them through labor, through work that would allow them to feel some sorts of pride um, has been taken from them. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas in the second photograph, um, they are waiting for relief checks. But again, it's that static image where no action is possible, um, no sense of individual pride and work is possible. And mm -hmm. the Edwin Roth poem also ends in this static image of just standing um, propped against a stone cold wall. So I yeah. think the three pieces work really, really well in conversation yeah. with each other. You're so right. You're, you're retroactively confirming the choice of season of death to go along with these two lying photos of that standing against the wall, waiting, uh, useless. Um, Chris, you're still there. We're putting you on the spots after just meeting you for the first time. Sorry. Do you want to say anything about the poem? I don't know if you have the text in front of you or you just had to hear it from me. No, I, I, what I would say is what interested me in addition to all the wonderful comments that were already made was the significance of the vivid imagery uh, in the poem and the vivid imagery in the photographs and the perspective of the photographer uh, and the perspective of the poet as people of some level of privilege looking at something at people who did not enjoy that privilege and being moved to want to memorialize and keep themselves awake to the advantage that they are have been given and the plight of those who are not as lucky as they are. And that just felt so contemporary. Uh, and, and especially at this moment when there are so many people who uh, slowly, but at least that's coming around, are beginning to acknowledge and become aware of their own privilege as they address and, and admit to the inequities that exist in our culture. And, and, and the hope, I think, that people take uh, in watching this unfold in that, like the NFL, as an example, you know, who were so uh, you know, sadly responsive to Colin, pa Colin, Powell, Colin Kaepernick's uh, protest a long time ago, now apologizing and saying they were wrong. I just, I, you know, that's, 
I, I think about that journey in the same way that Dorothea Lange made the journey from her studio to the street of, of people of privilege, of which I am one, uh, begin to become aware of that larger scope and not that not everybody else has that same privilege. Um, my question to you is about eyes and subjectivity. There, there's kind of a, a ever since romantic poetry cliche that if you have a subject, that is to say, uh, a, a speaker or narrator, and I'd actually like to ask Kate Colby to comment on this as well, if she wants to, that you have a, you have a subjectivity that sometimes in a first person poem turns into the eye. Uh, in this case, I think the eye is sort of very closely related to what Rolf does, and maybe it is Rolf. Um, and that, and the fact that you have an eye, and that eye, capital letter I, is looking into the eyes, seeing an, another, an other. And that eye, we hope, becomes a subjectivity. The eye of the other becomes a subjectivity, and you have intersubjectivity. The problem with situations like this, this crisis, the, the crisis of the depression in these two artworks, is that everybody's so downcast that, and the weather's shitty, that we can't see their eyes. It's, it was said by people who study the Holocaust, study genocide, that it's very hard to kill someone when you see their eyes, uh, harder than if you don't. I think that it was Terence Dupre who said that. I think that's probably true, but I think we're also discovering that it doesn't matter ultimately. People, people who are looking at you can still be killed if there's enough hate in you. And if you're creating an artwork and you are an overwhelming subject, subjectivity, it's your camera or your pen, it almost doesn't matter whether you can see their eyes. In this case, Ralph is struggling as the person of privilege to see the eyes everywhere. Right. But I wonder if Dupre was wrong, that it takes a whole lot more than to just show the eyes of another and other uh, to keep them from dying. I kind of loaded a lot on you, Chris, and I'm sorry for that. But do you have anything to say in response? Since you're a poet, you think well, about my, <laughs> my, my thought in response to what you were saying is that maybe that's one of the differentiating features between an artist capturing a photograph or a poet capturing a, a moment in poetry um, and someone who is documenting well-intentioned moved, et cetera, in that when, when a, I think when a Dorothea Lange captures an image, calculates both calculated and inspired, uh, the resulting image doesn't require anything other than there, whether it has eyes in the picture or not, to be impactful. And I think that would be what defines an artist. Whereas maybe um, the same picture you know, taken by uh, me, if I was standing there and had was moved to take it, would not be as impactful.